Let's pray. Our Father, as we now come to your word, we would ask that you would open your word to us, a familiar text. May we see its application to our heart today, how we would be responding. We pray, our Father, with confidence, because you have ordained each one to be under the hearing of the word today. And so we would ask that you would be our teacher. We would ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open God's word with me to Luke chapter 9. Our text will be the verses 10 through 17, but we'll begin the reading with verse 1 of Luke 9, page 866. This is God's word. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, proclaiming the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had arisen. Herod said, John, I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowds away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we're going to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. And then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. Did you know that the the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle other than Christ's resurrection that's recorded in all four gospels? So it's a very significant miracle for us. It's pointing us to who is Jesus Christ? Who is this who has come? And how are we to respond to this miracle? How are we to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ? So let's look at the miracle that Christ has performed here and then asking the question, as we've seen so often in the Gospel of Luke, who is this? Who is the Messiah of this miracle? And then if we understand that of who he is, then it's the challenge to us, then how will you respond? to this, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a sign for us. It's a calling to our faith, especially as we go through trials. So the event of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, the time is significant. The Gospel of John, chapter 6, 4, tells us that Passover was at hand. Passover at that time was in a very emotional time, more like our 4th of July. It had become very patriotic, nationalistic pride. It explains in part why after the miracle, the crowds were all stirred up and they were ready to take Christ and make him king and overthrow Rome. Passover did that. It also explains why there's large crowds. They're out in the wilderness. Well, they're at the northeast end of the Sea of Galilee, which today we know as the Golan Heights. They would have met there because that's the route that travelers would have taken at the time of Passover to avoid going through Samaria. You don't want to go through Samaria, you'll become unclean and won't be able to keep Passover. So they go the long way around the lake. That's why there's thousands of people here. 
the scriptures also tell us it's the time that the, dis- the disciples have just returned from their short-term missions trip, verses 1 through 9. And so the whole nation is talking about who is this Jesus Christ. Even King Herod is wondering, what is going on? He knows that he's just killed John the Baptist, but he realizes he has a much bigger problem on his hands now with this Jesus Christ. So the, the whole situation is very volatile. And you see the needs of everyone involved here, and particularly starting with the disciples and Christ. They come back from their missions trip, and Mark 6 records that they found Jesus just surrounded with the coming and the going. The multitudes were so many, Matthew 9.35, that they did not even have time to eat. Just exhausted. And you read between the lines, John the Baptist has just been killed. Remember who that is. That's Jesus Christ's cousin. And he's grieving. And he wants to go alone and to be in private and to deal with his own sorrow. Jesus and his disciples are are exhausted. So they go into the wilderness and the crowds track him. And thousands of people show up that are needy again. Does he send them away? Does he say, no, sorry, I'm exhausted? It's striking, verse 11. It says he welcomed them. What compassion. It's not my tolerance, not my threshold. For I think we all reach a threshold with so many demands on us, so many needy people, and we get jaded, we get callous, but the Lord responds in compassion. We're all just like these crowds. We're all demanding Christ's attention all the time. He never grows weary, never turns us away. So the account is set, and it says in verse 12, they've been there all day now, and they're they're not going to be able to walk the nine miles back to the closest town to get any food, if they could, the crowd that size. And the crowd, it says specifically, verse 14, it's 5,000 men. And it would be the men particularly that are going up to Jerusalem, but if you can imagine that there would be whole families, extended families, you could estimate this crowd to be... 20, 25,000 people. Verse 13 says, the only food they have, all these people, is five loaves and two fish, a little boy's lunch. When it says loaf of bread, don't think our big loaf of bread. Think of just a small little biscuit. And don't think fresh fish. There's no refrigeration at this time. Think two small sardines or anchovies, salted dried fish. The point is that this little lunch, biscuits and sardines, is not going to feed 20,000 people. They are complete, in a situation of complete inadequacy to provide for their needs. But the Lord provides. Verse 16, he blesses the food and he multiplies it and he gives it to his disciples to feed these thousands and thousands of people. In verse 17, they all ate and they were all full. Everyone had a good meal, everything that they wanted. Shows us how Christ does everything in excellence. He does everything well. Why would it say at the end of verse 17 that there were 12 baskets left over? Why that detail? Certainly it's to remind us again that Christ provides lavishly. He provides the best. When he turns water to wine, it's the best wine. So he's provided lavishly again. But I think the answer here is, as Barclay points out, it's, it's, it's for the 12 disciples. They are the ones that have been distributing the food to these thousands of people. And we can imagine just by human nature, they, they're also wondering, where are they going to eat? <laughs> They haven't eaten yet. The custom was those who served the meal would eat last. And Barclay points out the culture of the day when you served a banquet, those who served the meal would get the leftovers after the meal. And so here they are, the disciples, 12 disciples, and there's 12 baskets. The Lord is making sure that each one of them are also cared for. The Lord is so kind and so 
generous in all that he does. He's providing for the crowds, the thousands of people, but he's also remembering to provide for each of the 12. The miracle. It's to point us to Christ and to ask this question, who is Jesus Christ? Who is this Messiah of this miracle? Intentionally, we're supposed to see that Christ is, is greater than Moses. Moses provided bread and manna in the wilderness. You remember when Israel was wandering in the wilderness and he came to the Lord. And the Lord provided the manna through Moses. And here's one greater now providing manna, living bread. This one is God himself who is coming to provide for his people. 1 Corinthians 10.3 says it was the pre-incarnate Son of God who fed the people in the wilderness. Water came from the rock, and that rock was Christ. Christ is the one, pre-incarnate Christ is the one who fed them the bread, who fed them the water, and here he is again. He's sustaining their lives, and he's sustaining their lives not just with physical bread, but to point that he is the living bread who has come, that all who put their trust in him will live forever. You trust in him as your Lord and Savior. He gives you eternal life, John 6, 36, so that you will live forever. This one is greater than Moses who fed us bread in the wilderness. But it's even more than that. This should be a signal that the prophecies have been fulfilled, that here is God himself come as the good shepherd to provide for his people in the wilderness. As you saw the crowd sitting down in the green grass, you should have been reminded of Ezekiel 34. And Mark makes the, that connection explicit. He's, he looks at the crowd and saw them as sheep without a shepherd and in great compassion then feeds them. The prophecy of the day that the good shepherd is coming one day has now arrived. And Jesus Christ is God himself who has come as the good shepherd to feed his people. Ezekiel 34, the prophecy, quote, For thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country." I will feed them with good pasture. On the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down with good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the stray. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. The prophecy that the good shepherd will come someday as God himself has arrived. Jesus Christ commands them all settle down in the green pastures and I will feed you. And he feeds them so they want no more. Every one of his sheep that day would say, I shall not want my cup overflows. Fulfilling Psalm 23. Who is this one that's feeding the thousands it's God himself come to be the shepherd of his people. If that's who Jesus Christ is, you see, then that brings us to the, th the third aspect here of the miracle, and that's, that's the message. How are we to apply this? If Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, God incarnate, come to feed his people, then how is that to affect your life? How is that to affect the life of these disciples? If they really saw who it was. And Jesus uses this as a test to point them to how they're supposed to apply their faith in him, especially in trials. John 6 says, in the parallel account of this, that Jesus said to his disciples, you feed them to test them, because he knew what he was going to do. This has all been planned. He has a reason for this. And he's going to use this in the life of his disciples to, to grow their faith. He's not using this to crush them. He's using this 
them to teach them about how to grow in faith, particularly how to apply faith in trials. And we can see at least these three lessons here that Jesus is using this time to teach them and to teach us to rely not on ourselves, but on Christ. Secondly, in trials, to obey in faith before you see the evidence. And third, to apply to new situations what you've already learned. Christ is teaching the disciples that day as he uses this time of testing, he uses this trial to teach us, teach them to rely not on yourselves, but on Christ. Verse 13 is emphatic. He said, we need to feed all these thousands of people. And verse 13 says, Jesus says to them, you feed them. It's emphatic. You give them food. What? How are we supposed to give them food? Jesus wasn't saying this to crush them, to discourage them, but he was using it intentionally to make them acknowledge and bring them to the end of their own resources. We don't have the ability to do this. He wants them to get to all of us to, to see that. And one of the reasons that he uses trials in our life is to bring us to the end of ourselves, not to rely on ourselves, which is the default. To acknowledge our bankruptcy, to acknowledge we don't have the ability to do this. All of our life, Jesus is teaching us again and again and again, John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. But the default is, we look inside and we say, how am I going to respond to this? How am I going to meet this in, the, in my own resources? We must remember that nothing in this created world can satisfy the heart that was created to enjoy God and to only a relationship to God through Christ. And one purpose in trials is to remove our trust in ourselves, to remove our trust in this world instead of Christ. When you go through trials and you feel overwhelmed, even a sense of panic. And you begin to think to yourself, I feel, I feel drowning in this problem. How am I ever supposed to meet this? How am I ever gonna manage? How am I ever gonna get through this? I don't have the strength for this. I don't have the power for this. Of course you don't. Christ has brought you into this time of testing, not to crush you, but to Turn your attention away from looking at yourself. You don't have the resources for this. He knows that. You're to look to him and his provision to learn to grow in trusting him. Do you have a situation in your life now that has brought you to this place of saying, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. Well, don't look inside. Look away from yourself to the provision of Christ. And Christ brings them to this situation, an impossible situation to feed a crowd of thousands of people with two sardines. One reason is he brings them to this place to teach them to rely not on themselves, but on Christ. There's a second lesson that he's using this to teach them, and that is to teach them to obey in faith before they ever see the evidence. You notice how Christ commands the disciples to have the group sit down in groups of 50s, verse 14, the other gospels say 50s, 100s. Why? Well, certainly it's to show order, and so be you no know, confusion, make sure everybody's gonna get fed. And perhaps there's even a parallel to Moses who divided up Israel into groups of 50. I think primarily this is a test of faith. Are you going to obey him before you see the evidence? Imagine what's going through the people's minds and maybe they even are asking the disciples, maybe some of the children are asking their parents, what are we doing? Sit down everybody in groups of 50. Why? Uh, because we're going to eat. Oh, good, what's for supper? Uh, we don't know. We don't have anything. But sit down. Why are we sitting down? Well, because we're going to eat. Eat what? We don't know. But they obeyed, and they all sat down in groups of 50. Before they saw the miracle, 
before they saw the bread division, before they had anything in their hands. The little boy that comes that day is to also show us this. He comes that way. He, he obeys. He gives away what he has before he sees how the Lord's, what the Lord's going to do with it. He has no idea. The Gospel of John records that Andrew had gone and found him. The Gospel of John records Andrew three times, and any time Andrew is recorded in the Gospel, he's always finding somebody and bringing them to Christ. He finds this little boy, and he brings him. And the little boy gives away everything that he had before he knew he was going to be fed himself. It's only John that points out that the bread he gave was made of barley, which is the food of the poor. This little boy would have nothing left. Think of his options. He could have refused, knowing that at least he would have enough food to get home that night. Or he could have given part and kept part, better be safe than sorry. Or he could have sold it, made a profit. He could have hid them. But he gave it all away to Christ to use. Don't ever think that what you have is inadequate. What could Christ do with the likes of this? It's so little, so inadequate. Children, don't ever think the Lord won't use you. You give yourself to Christ and say, use me, however you wish, for the good of your kingdom. And and Christ will, and the Lord blessed this little boy's lunch. And he fed thousands of people through what this little boy did. Don't ever ever think you're too young, too inadequate. So when the Lord brings trials into your life, he's asking you, are you going to trust me in this? Are you going to trust me before you see the results? When you go through times of darkness and confusion and fear, before you see the results, will you obey me? Larry Crabb's quote is insightful. If Jesus were to say to us, only in the mystery of suffering will you stop trying to fit me into your understanding of life. Suffering without explanation creates the opportunity for faith in me, the kind of faith that sees my heart. Suffering with explanation allows you to maintain the false hope of control. If God brought you through trials and always explained what he is doing and always showed you the end of the matter and always explained everything to you, you wouldn't grow in faith. You'd probably keep your own selfish illusion of controlling your life. But trials without explanation creates an opportunity for faith. God brings all things into our life that are planned And he he asks you, will you obey me and will you trust me in this before you know the results, regardless of how you feel, before you see the purposes and how it's all going to work out? You may never see how it's going to work out in this life. Will you trust me? Will you obey me first? Will you sit down in groups of 50 before you know if there's going to be any food for supper? Neil Orchard and a farmer friend were walking through a lush soybean and cornfields. There had been an abundance of rain. The results were evident. The crops were lush and green. And so the comment from the farmer was surprising. He said, quote, my crops are especially vulnerable. Even a short drought could have a devastating effect. And Neil said, "Uh, why, What's, what's the danger? The farmer went on to explain that when there's an abundance of rain, the plants are not required to push their roots deep in search of water. The roots remain near the surface of the soil. And so a drought with hot sun would find the plants not prepared and they would quickly die. Abundance of rain, easy times, roots don't go deep. One of the purposes of the Lord bringing trials into your life is for the roots to go deep 
in faith. To obey him in the middle of trials before you ever know, or if you'll ever know, what his purpose was in all of it. To walk by faith and not by sight. This feeding of the 5,000 men was all of the Lord's design to teach them. He knew what he was doing. And the lesson that day for them and for us is at least these, to teach us to rely not on ourselves but on Christ. And to teach us to obey in faith before we see the evidence. The third lesson is when the Lord brings trials into your life and brings us into times of testing, it's to teach us to apply to new situations what you've already learned. Think about the disciples at this point where they are with Christ. This is not day one of the first day they've met him. All that they have seen of the power and authority of Christ. It's not even a full list, but they've seen water turned to wine. They've seen a miraculous catch of fish that nearly broke their nets. They've seen the widow's son, and they've seen Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. They've seen lepers miraculously healed. They've already been in that violent storm that they thought they were going to drown, and Christ just simply said, be still. The storms were still, and there was calm. And they said, who is this? They've already seen the power of Jesus Christ. They've seen that he is the ruler and all authority over all of creation, all of the demons, all disease, even death itself. They've seen this. They've witnessed this. They've even witnessed his power through them. In this short-term missions trip, Christ had sent them out with the authority to preach the gospel and to have the miracles of healing and casting out demons. And they all came back excited and thrilled. We've seen your authority. The point is, fellas, you're supposed to be applying this to new situations. What have you already learned of Christ? Apply that now to this situation of the feeding of 5,000 men. What do you know of Christ? It's like a teacher giving a pop quiz class has been called to, to order and Teacher says, surprise, we're having a quiz today. I just want to see what you've already learned. That's what a trial is when the Lord brings it into your life. You might say it's a pop quiz. What have you already learned of Christ up to this point? What have you already seen in his word? And how will you apply that now to this new situation? You look at the disciples and you think, why wouldn't they have believed? Well, let's not be too hard on them. It's the same question for you and me. And we're in a far greater place than even the disciples. We are this side of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his ascension into glory. We're this side of Pentecost. We're this side of seeing for thousands of years God's faithfulness to the spread of the gospel to the nations and his provision for his people over and over and over again. Why haven't you applied what you've already seen in the lives of others and in your own life, how God has been faithful? Apply that now to this new situation. Everything you've already learned of Christ and his word, you're to apply that to every new trial that comes into your life. This is one of the benefits of being in the church of Jesus Christ with multi-generations. It's what a comfort it has been to me over the years of having older believers in the congregation, and they've walked with Christ for years and years and years, and they've seen God to be faithful. And God has provided for them and sustained them. And it gets, doesn't it give you hope and comfort as you're going through and you look around and you see God has provided for others. He'll provide for me too. When the Lord brings you into times of testing and you remember this is a plan, this is under God's purpose and tr under his sovereignty, it's not a time to let your emotions just get out of control. You're to use your mind and quiet in your heart, still your heart. What do you know about God? 
This is not a time just to give way to fear and anxiety and panic and stress and discouragement and unbelief and darkness and despair and grumbling and complaining and anger and being driven by controlled. If the Lord has sovereignly planned this, then he's already prepared you to handle it. He's already taught you so much about himself and his power, his provision. And look at how he sustained his church through all these years. Apply that now to the new situation so that you learn to walk by faith and not by sight. If Jesus Christ really is God incarnate to come to care for his sheep, and he will provide for you everything you need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And we're to learn from that, that when he brings you into trials, it's to teach you not to rely on yourself, but on Christ. It's to teach you to obey in faith before you see the evidence. It's to teach you to apply to new situations what you've already learned. Will you? Richard Baxter put it, the good shepherd is not drowning his sheep when he washes them, nor killing them when he shears them. Rather, his washings are needed cleansings, his shearings are needed strippings, his corrections are essential lessons, trials are his sovereign tests to grow your faith. Maybe you're under the hearing of the word today and you wouldn't say that Christ is your shepherd. You don't know if you're his sheep. You've never professed your faith in Christ. Come to Christ. He's promised he would never drive anyone who comes, he would never drive away anyone who comes to him. Put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and know not only the forgiveness of sins and pardon and reconciliation to God, but to know him as a good shepherd that will care for you and bring you through life and bring you through all the trials. We need to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Shall we pray? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, thank you that Christ has come, the Good Shepherd, God himself. The Good Shepherd has given his life for us and laid down his life upon the cross for our, the forgiveness of our sins. Our Good Shepherd is continually caring for his sheep and feeding his church and even today intercedes for us how grateful we are to belong to him. Our Father, we pray that you would apply your word to each heart today as we need to apply it and grow our faith in the riches of the promises that Christ has given to us that's the rock of your word and all of the promises that are sure and guaranteed in Christ. Our Father, we pray that your word would bear much fruit in our lives today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.